welcome to today's class. Uh, we'll carry on with uh, our discussion on secondary structure. So last time we were mainly talking about alpha helices. So uh, you know, continuing with that, just a brief recap of what we uh, looked at uh, last class. So this was, uh, you know, the right-handed alpha helix we were talking about. Then we focus on the hydrogen bonds. A lot of symmetry operations. For example, here the oxygen atoms are in red, nitrogen atoms in blue, carbon atoms in black, and then um, uh, you have the helix which is stabilized by these um, intrahelical hydrogen bonds. And you have these geometrical considerations or characteristics. Remember, we talked about this um, coordinates. Uh, you know, we even uh, derived these um, uh, symmetry transformations. Okay, so this was uh, the geometry of a simple helix that uh, I was talking to. I was referring to right now. Uh, based on this, we looked at those uh, symmetry issues, and uh, you know some properties uh, we looked at. It always almost like a cylindrical appearance, and it has these properties like 3.6 precedence per turn. These are the phi and psi values. Remember, these uh, belong uh, to the Ramachandran plot. Then you have hydrogen bond between the i at and i plus fourth residue, and it's mostly always means mostly right hand. Now, the last uh, you know slide where we stopped had this uh, thing where you know this thing written out there which is the another other unusual helices that means we have talked about this right handed helix uh, that is the most um, common one what are the other uh, helices uh, possible so one is uh, this is referred to as a three tenth of a helix it is uh, you can see the corresponding phi and psi values it is found in proteins when a regular helix is distorted by the presence of unfavorable residues near turn regions or in short helices the hydrogen bonds they are found between the i and i plus 3 residue instead of i plus 4 as in a regular alpha helix. Now there are 3 residues per turn and 10 backbone atoms between donor and acceptor atoms right. Try to refer to what we had in case of alpha helices there were 3.6 residues per turn and then it is tighter and narrower than a normal or regular alpha helix. The other one is referred to as a pi helix so you can uh, look at the phi and psi angles 1 phi is minus 57 psi is minus 70, it is more loosely coiled, the hydrogen bonds occur between i and i plus 5 with residue. So okay, i and i plus 5, it is not i and i plus 4, neither i and i plus 3 which we just saw for the 3 tenth of a helix. Okay. Then uh, this has 4.4 .4 residues per turn and these can be very long. So this is what I was talking about, so if you look at it from the top, uh, as you can see these are the rare variations, uh, so um, this panel, you can look at my arrow, this panel is a 3 tenth of a helix. This is uh, the pi helix. You can see how um, how uh, loose uh, the structure looks at from the top, right? And you compare it with the helical wheel uh, wheel we had when we were looking at it just down the cylinder. That that was the helical cylinder from the top. Okay. So here, as you can see, with hydrogen bonds uh, to residues n plus five or n plus three. So n plus five is for the pi, n plus three for the three tenth of a helix instead of the n plus four, which is the regular alpha helix. Okay. So as I said, the three tenth helix has three residues per turn that we just saw, and that's what three means out here. Okay, so quick comparison. So on the left, you have the three tenth of a helix, right? Phi and psi angles. Uh, phi, uh, then in, in the middle, we have the alpha helix. You remember this is how what it looked like when we looked at it from the top. Okay, so you have the side chains which are protruding out, and then this is a pi helix. You can see the pi helix is look, uh, it's looking a lot looser. Okay, so it has a much looser coil. Okay. So, uh, looking at the Ramachandran plot, you know this is where the three tenth of a helix comes. This is uh, where uh, the helix, regular helix, comes on average, right? Now, a comparison of the phi and psi values. Then, so this is the left-handed alpha helix, phi 57, psi 47. Left-handed, it is where in the positive quadrant of your Ramachandran plot. Then, these are the corresponding values of three tenth of helix, pi helix. Then, there are type two helices which are uh, normally adapted by polyproline, polyglycine and then you have collagen. So collagen is something, we will not talk about the phi and psi values in that details, at least it is given out here. Collagen is something we will come to later, okay, when we talk about helix helix packing. Now an important feature of um, helical segments or helices is a dipole, commonly referred to as helix dipole or helical dipole or even helix macro dipole. Okay. So, as the title of the slide says, the alpha helix has a dipole moment. Now, if you look at the alpha helix, you see this is the peptide bond. You can look at the dipole moments out here. Then here, 
this is uh, the alpha helical um, uh, you know secondary structure uh, schematic this is the c terminus this is the n terminus you can see all the dipoles you know pointing down towards n right okay and on the right side is the schematic of the helix with the phosphate um, out here attached to the n terminus now what is what happens is in this case the c terminus is negatively charged the n terminus is positively charged so the first one it's the dipole of a peptide unit this is what you're seeing then the, this is uh, panel B of figure B. So, the dipoles of peptide units are aligned along the alpha helical axis, which creates an overall dipole moment in the alpha helix. This, if this A refers to alpha actually. So, how does it do, or what, are the, what is the charge distribution? So, the dipole moment is such that it is positively charged at the minor end, that is uh, N terminus, and negatively charged at the carboxyl end. Now, keep in mind if you look at this um, figure, so what we just said is this N terminus is positively charged the C terminus is negatively charged right. Now, if you look at this alpha helix, you see there is a phosphate residue here, there is a phosphate uh, group rather, which is um, you know attached to the uh, kind of um, interacting with the N terminus. Now remember, phosphate is negatively charged, the N terminus is positively charged. So, you have that favorable interaction out here. So, then about the more about the helix macro dipole. So, as it says, as we just discussed for this uh, figure C, Negatively charged groups such as phosphate uh, ions frequently bind to the amino ends of alpha helices. Now, the dipole moment of an alpha helix as well as the possibility of hydrogen bonding to free NH group at the end of the helix favors surge binding. So, you can think about this now. If you have any positively charged partners or negatively charged partners which are supposed to bind to alpha helices to you know induce some sort of uh, binding phenomena or some sort of some sort of uh, signaling events, then based on the polarity that means based on the positively charged n terminus and the negatively charged c, c terminus they would know where to bind okay and this is very important and that's why alpha helices really have been found to have a pretty well defined dipole which is often referred to as the helical macro dipole okay now let's uh, you know take an example of this uh, dipole effect of the helix how can we substantiate so, one way, so you know there are many ways of doing it, is one way is let us do a comparison between two peptides. So, we have two peptides. So, the first one is glutamate 20, alanine 20, and the second one is alanine 20, glutamate 20. So, you, have under, so you understand. So, glutamate 20 is at the N terminus, then you have the alanine 20 residues, that is for one peptide. Then for the second one, you start with the alanine 20, that is the alanine 20 residues. This is starting from the N terminus, and then at the C terminal end, that means after you are done with the alanine residues, you have the glutamate residues. So, that is the difference that means you have switched the positions of this glutamate 20 residues from the N terminus to the C terminus. Okay. Now, in both the peptides the alla 20 group is the one which is forming the helix that means this alla 20 group of amino acids they are the ones which form the helix. Now, at pH is equal to 10 there is an observation right. It is observed that at pH equal to 10 if you do a thermal denaturation that means you are denaturing you are trying to denature this peptide by increasing temperature. This thermal denaturation and everything we will talk about in details, what T A means we will also talk about in details. Now, T M essentially means that when you are denaturing the peptide, then there comes a certain um, temperature called T M, which is called the melting temperature, that is what M stands for. That means, you have half, so, so here half, the, that is uh, if you know you have two states so essentially, that means half of the molecules are folded, half of the molecules are unfolded. So, now what it says is, at pH is equal to 10, the T m, which is a signature of the stability, a general signature of the stability of a peptide for this glute, the first peptide, which is GLU 20 ALA 20 is about 42 degrees Celsius higher than that of the other one, right? the glutamine is on the other side. So, what it means is, that means the first peptides, peptide at pH is equal to 10 is much more stable to, an, uh, to uh, an extent of about 40 degrees more stable than the second peptide under these conditions. However, now if you do exactly the same experiment that means exactly the same thermal denaturation, but throwing in about 0.4 molar of salt in the solution, you can see that the difference decreases to about 17 degrees Celsius. Now, why this is so? Do we have a reason for it? So, let us look at the reason. So, let us look at the peptide um, uh, dipole moment again, right? The, uh, the helical dipole. So, again this is the helical dipole you can see here, N terminus positively charged, the C terminus negatively charged. Now, there you have the helix, you have the glutamate 20 out here this is the first peptide and then so the n terminus you have and then you have the 
this is the ala 20 for you okay then you have the other peptide where this helical part is the ala 20 and then you have the glutamate residues on the other side now see what you have done is see here in this one in the first peptide that means um, in the glutamate 20 allen 20 you see this glu 20 is on the side where the helix is positively charged on the other one it is on the side when the helix is negatively charged now if you try to remember what the side chain of glutamate is so the side chain of glutamate is this so that means at pH is equal to 10 it is deep protonated this is having a negative charge now for the moment think about this where would it be having stabilizing interactions or where would it interact favorably would it be interacting favorably in this one that means the last peptide or would it be interacting favorably here the answer is obviously here right because here the glutamate residues are where at the end terminus which is positively charged so it can have favorable interactions that means this negatively charged carboxyl group can have favorable uh, interactions with this with this positively charged end terminus right and that is why we say that this glutamate 20 out here is stabilizing so now you understand why if you do not have any salt that means you have taken both of these both this one and this one in pH 10 no salt remember no salt means not that high concentration of salt I uh, have not added extra salt except that coming from the buffer and then what you do is you do this TM and because this is much more stable for the glutamate residues out here electrostatically stabilizing your end terminus positive drive positive end of the dipole hence this is about 40 degrees uh, more stable than this one that means 40 degrees Celsius is more stable than this one right now what happens in case of the salt so now you understand in case of the salt the decrease uh, the difference decreases why does it decrease simple because see when I am putting in salt you know, the, what the salt will do is salt will be having positive and negative charges so the salt will start screening this interaction screening this favorable interaction right once it starts screening this favorable interaction the stabilizing effect of that glutamate residue you know GLE 20 in this case decreases or we can also say like this this glutamate out here was destabilizing in the sense that it was interacting with a negatively charged uh, dipole but now once you start putting in salts what will happen is this unfavorable interaction would be screened to a huge extent and hence the difference which was like 40 degrees Celsius in the TMs comes down to about 17 degrees Celsius so that is why now they are much more closer in terms of their stability. So I hope you have uh, understood this point this is an effect of your helix dipole coming into play. So then the reasons for these observations in absence of salt the GLE 20 residues remain fully ionized and hence stabilize the positively charged end terminus through favorable electrostatic interactions right. In presence of the salt however what happens is the forced electrostatic interactions are screened and thereby the difference in the stability decreases okay. So again this is the influence or the effect that your helical macro dipole can have on stability of a given system in this case this glutamate alanine peptide okay we have talked enough of, uh, about alpha helices uh, let us move on to the next most common secondary structural element which is the beta sheet okay this is as it says the second major structural element found in proteins it has hydrogen bonding in um, you know has hydrogen bonding as in alpha helices obviously because alpha is also have hydrogen bonding but in this case the hydrogen bonding is between chains rather than within one chain remember alpha helix we had everything in one chain it is like a cylinder but not in beta sheet beta sheet is in between chains or in between something known as strands hence the structure is built up from a combination of several regions okay so the beta strands are generally composed of 5 to 10 residues now you will see these especially the second point about these between chain the hydrogen bonds then beta sheets formed from multiple strands are generally pleated in appearance with successive C alpha atoms remember this carbon alpha atoms above and below the plane okay you will again see this structure very soon and the R groups which are the uh, amino acid side chains of the is a, uh, adjacent amino acids in a beta sheet also protrude in these opposite directions like the C alpha atoms up down like that okay so here this is the beta sheet now think about this a beta sheet is composed of minimum of two strands and then you can go on adding strands I will tell you what the beta strands are but there are two ways of this getting oriented 
See, for example, if you look at this, this is, uh, this is um, a schematic of an anti-parallel beta sheet. So what has happened is, first of all, what are we looking at? So you look at this, this is from n, this is c, that means it is from the n terminus to this to the c terminus, right? This is one strand. Now again, here, the second, to the right of it, there is another strand, which is from going from the n terminus to the c terminus. Now you can see these red bonds, which are the hydrogen bonds. Now think about what we had talked uh, in the previous slide. What we said in the second point was it has hydrogen bonds like alpha helices, but unlike the alpha helix where it is in one continuous chain, here you have the hydrogen bonds between two chains, right? And each of these chains individually, like from N to C or N to C or N to C, each of this chain individually is referred to as a strand, and the strands together form a sheet. Okay. Now that's one. So that means we now know that you need at least two strands to form a beta sheet. These strands have hydrogen bonds, as you can see, the red ones. These are the hydrogen bonds. These are the hydrogen bonds, right? Throughout. Now, you also see one more thing. See, I can have an alternate arrangement too. See, see the way the arrangement out here is. It goes from N to C, then here, from here it starts and then it goes to C. Then it goes again from N to C and it goes from N to C. So, it is almost like, say, if you follow my arrow, you are coming like this, you are coming like this, like this, then you are making a U turn, you are going like this, then you are making another U turn, you are coming like this, then you are making another U turn, you are going like this. So that means, in terms of the orientation, the first strand is how is it oriented from N to C. The next strand is oriented from C to N, isn't it? Because here N, it started from the N terminus, but here the second strand is ending at the C terminus. That means its orientation is from N to C. Here the orientation is from N to C. Okay. So this means this is called antiparallel because one is going like this. this is say this is N, this is C. The other one is going like this. That means this is N, this is C. That just in strands, and hence it's antiparallel. That's why it's called antiparallel beta strand. Now, if you look at this schematic, you can see how these things are moving up and down like this. So this is what is referred to as a pleat. You will see it again in the next slide. Okay, and this arrow is kind of the uh, direction of this N to C. That means this arrow is for the first strand. Say, now if you go to the second strand, this arrow would be reversed, and then it's giving rise to antiparallel beta sheet. Now, not only that. You look at these hydrogen bonds, you know these hydrogen bonds you can see they are formed, they are pretty symmetric in appearance, aren't they? They are very symmetric in appearance. You can see here is the way the alignment is done is that H and O are very well aligned to form the hydrogen bond with minimum penalty. That means with minimum conformation and strain. Now with respect to what I will just tell you. But before that, remember if you are having something as an anti-parallel beta sheet, that means there is there must be something which is a parallel beta sheet, okay? We will look at it very soon. But anyway, uh, just to drive home the point, the main difference between alpha helix and the beta sheet is the fact that in alpha helix, all the hydrogen atom, uh, the hydrogen bonds, the intrahelical hydrogen bonds are in the same chain, but in case of beta sheet, it is actually in between two adjacent strands. Okay? So the amino acids, successive strands have alternating directions, right? So one is like this, the other one is like this, then the next one is like this, and the next one is like this. So this is called antiparallel arrangement. Okay. So again, looking at the antiparallel beta sheet. So you can see this is the N to C. This one is goes from N to C like this. Okay, this N to C in this direction. The next strand is N to C in this direction. Here the green ones are the hydrogen bonds. Again, see they are so well disposed to each other to give rise to the symmetric nature of the hydrogen bonds. Okay, now that was one thing. But there's one more important thing. You look at the flanking. You look at this, or you look at this. See, see suppose, suppose I have not shown here. Suppose after this there is a third strand. Say there is a third strand. Okay. So that, but here there is no other strand. So look at what happened to this H, this O, this H, this O. Look at all these green arrows. As it says, these are unsatisfied hydrogen bonding partners. Okay. Similarly, what happens on the other side? What hap will happen on the other side is, in the other side we do not have anything. Then the, again, these would also be unsatisfied. So that means there is at least, say, if you have two beta strands making one beta sheet, that means there will be two sides which would be having this unsatisfied hydrogen bonds, right? like this, you know, there would be two faces. Now, if you have three strands and the middle strand is, if, let me go to the previous slide. So, for example, if you look at these two strands, these two middle strands, they are hydrogen bond to both. right? So, that means they do not have any unsatisfied hydrogen bond donors or acceptors. However, the first strand and the last strand, now they are not satisfied. So, this is why if you would, um, you know, 
uh, if, you, if you would um, go through papers and if you look at characteristics of beta sheets or look at proteins which um, tend to aggregate a lot because protein aggregation is a huge thing, then you will see that proteins which are having beta sheets or beta sheet character tend to aggregate a lot more because see on this these faces they have unsatisfied hydrogen bonds or bonding partners. So that means these at the first opportunity would like to interact with something so that these unsatisfied uh, bonds are getting satisfied. Okay. Now let us look at a two stranded beta antipel pleated sheet to emphasize this pleated appearance. Okay. This is what I was talking about. You can see how it is coming from here. It goes down, it moves up, it goes down, it moves up. So that means one is on top, the other one is on bottom. So top of plane, bottom of plane, top of plane, bottom of plane. This is what it gives rise to the pleated appearance. You now if you have looked at uh, shirts and all, you, you will sometimes see the tailor puts a pleat in the shirt. Essentially that is what we are talking about. We also see between two residues, between two residues, your distance is about 7 angstroms. Okay. So each residue of beta strand accounts for about 0 0.3 to you know 0 0.34 nanometer or, or 3.4 angstroms or 3.2 angstroms of the overall length. In contrast to the compact coil on front alpha helix where each residue corresponds to 0 0.15 nanometer overall length. So think about this, right? In alpha helix it is 1.5 angstrom, but in this case it is 3.2 or 3.4 angstrom. 3.2 is essentially for a parallel uh, beta helix. 3.4 is for an anti parallel beta helix, uh, beta sheet. I mean, okay, multiple stranded uh, beta anti parallel pleated sheet. Again, so this is what again I was uh, telling you. Now you have multiple strands. Before you have two strands. You can see how these strands are. This one is coming down. This one is going up. Again, you see the definitive pleated appearance. And again, these pink ones are your hydrogen bonds. Okay. And here you can see the first strand out here or the first strand towards you and the last strand which is away from you. These are again having hydrogen bonding partners, acceptors and donors both which are not satisfied. Okay. As I was telling, we have this anti parallel beta sheet arrangement. Then what about the parallel beta sheet? What does it do for us? So this is what the parallel beta sheet looks like. Let us look at the schematic. So the parallel beta sheet, right? now you can see first and most important thing, you see this going from N to C. In case of anti parallel beta sheet, the next one would go from N to C like this, but here you can see this goes from N to C, this also goes from N to C. Again this one goes from N to C and this one goes from N to C. That means all of them are pointing in the same direction, that means parallel. Hence it is a parallel beta sheet, but then what is the result? As a result of this, what you can see is that you can see these um, hydrogen bonds, hydrogen bonds out here, they are not they are at an angle now, they are not exactly so, the, I mean the NH and the CO groups are not so disposed that they can form these uh, bonds in collinear geometry and almost collinear geometry I mean. In this case they are at certain angles and hence you can understand that this set of arrangement or this structure does have or does suffer from conformational strain. So if you would ever think which one would be found more in proteins then it would be the anti parallel arrangement not the parallel arrangement. Okay. And this is uh, the right side you have a schematic of how it looks like. Again this is the pleat coming from this parallel arrangement. Now you can ask this, okay, I have looked at anti parallel beta sheet, we looked at it just now. We are on the slide where we are um, seeing the parallel beta sheet, but now can we have a mixture? That means can we have the anti parallel beta sheet and the parallel beta sheet and the same protein? As a matter of fact, we do. So here, for the before I leave this slide, for the parallel beta sheet, the amino acids in the line strands run in the same direction. Okay, and again, the, uh, you see the parallel beta sheet. You see this is N to C. This is also N to C, and here this unsatisfied hydrogen bond partners. Okay, now this is the case of mixed beta sheet that I was talking about. Okay, here you see one, two, three. So the first three you have this anti parallel arrangement N C, then N C again this N C. But then after that you have the Parallel. So this is the case where you have a mixed beta sheet. That means this one is anti-parallel, right? So this one is anti-parallel out here, and this one is parallel. Okay. But you can see, as you uh, as I said on the left, only about twenty percent of sheets are of mixed type because you can understand that if you do not have any other stabilizing interaction, it's very hard to have such a strain in that in this structure, isn't it? And this because you have this parallel beta sheet arrangement where the hydrogen bonds are at a strain 
and the antipel bedsheet arrangement where they are well disposed. So, in combination the structure does su suffer from significant amount of strain which has to be stabilized by some other interactions only then can we have these things coexisting that is why it is only in 20 percent of the sheets it is found. Okay. So, again this is an example of this mixed beta sheet just another perspective another way of looking at it here you have this anti parallel arrangement as you can see you can look at the arrows this arrow goes here this arrow goes here this arrow goes here and then the parallel these two arrows also goes in the same direction. Okay. To look at uh, the Ramachandran plot where does the beta sheet come through? So, this is where the beta sheet comes through the anti parallel and the parallel beta sheet right. Now, uh, we had looked at a table like this before let us incorporate the beta 1. So, here if you compare with the alpha helices or 3 times of the helix or even the pi helix the parallel beta has these phi and psi angles. Okay. If you can look if you look at this this is this is the phi which is in the negative side, but the psi is in positive now. So, phi minus 119 psi 113 for anti parallel beta it is minus 139 and psi is positive 135 and as I was telling you again. So, this is psi on the y axis this is phi the x axis. So, you can see if it is in this region then phi is negative for it because 0 is here for phi. However, 0 it is above 0 for psi hence psi is positive and that is what you see here okay? and that is what you see here so, so psi being positive for both parallel and parallel beta sheets, but phi is negative for both of these. Okay. Now, these are the two most important secondary structural elements right they are almost present in each and I mean in almost all proteins or majority of the proteins let me tell you. Okay. So, you pick up one protein in you know there is very good chance of it, it having a either a alpha or a beta or a mix mixture of that. Okay. Then what do we mean by loops and turns are there some other secondary structural elements. Now, think about this if you remember those anti parallel or parallel beta sheet arrangements say let us uh, you know think about the anti parallel arrangement I have one like this strand like this and I have the other strand going like this. Now, see you have to make a turn as I was saying you have to make a u turn right. If you are going to make a u turn you better have something which connects these two. So, that means you are actually form a loop forming a loop uh, you know hairpins if you have seen they look like this the this um, uh, this part where you are connecting both arms is bent the same thing is going to happen here. So, that is where loops and turns come in that means they kind of acting as a bridge between your strands or between your different secondary structural elements. So, here loops we can see to your right or let us start from here. So, this is this arrow signifies one strand this uh, other signifies another strand of uh, beta so there are two beta strands and you can see this one arrow is in this direction this one is in this direction this is an anti parallel uh, beta sheet and you can see it is uh, uh, connected by a loop region. So, the loop essentially connects these two strands. So, on the right side you have two examples of that two examples of hairpin loops so it, it looks like an hairpin you can see if you follow this arrow it looks uh, almost like a hairpin that is what it looks like uh, here is not it it looks like a it looks like a hairpin that is what it looks like. Okay. So, you have um, beta strand 1 beta strand 2 here also beta strand 1 beta strand 2 these are two different ways of looking at the hairpin loops I will come to this in the next um, few slides. But what is the major thing is if you look at this what does this one show? This one shows the frequency of hairpin loops of different lengths in 60 proteins. Now, the question you are going to ask is okay, I am having this strand and I am having this strand and I am going to connect it with the loop of amino acids. Now, what how many amino acids can I have in a loop? Is there a statistical number? Is there a statistical representation? Do we know which one is most? That means do we have 4 uh, amino acids in the loop to be occurring the most do we have 2 do we have 3 so on. So, that is what this histogram tells you you can see this is the number of residues and this is a number of loop regions you can have and you can see how it goes right. So, the number of residues which is 2 it is almost the highest and then I think it is uh, either 4 a little uh, above 4, but anyway uh, that is the significance of this um, uh, uh, figure and then as I said these are two of the frequently occurring loops or reverse turns as we saw here. Now, going a little more into this loop thing what are the features of the loop some of the features now the secondary structural elements alpha helices and beta strands are often connected by loop regions as I was just telling you or we just saw. 
the loops have no regular conformations or main hydrogen bonding or main chain it should be it should be main chain hydrogen bonding patterns but can form hydrogen bonds with solvent molecules okay these are often found on the surfaces of proteins right and loop regions connecting two adjacent beta strands are often referred to as hairpin loops that's what we just talked about the loop regions are inherently flexible and frequently participate in forming binding sites and enzyme active sites so you can understand right you have it's like a hinge you have this you have this right and it's forming a loop so this loop region is pretty flexible you know has to be flexible and hence it is so uh, uh, frequently found in binding sites and enzyme active sites okay so then related to the loop well it is a loop we give it a different name it's a beta turn it is essentially the simplest secondary structure element it involves usually four residues it allows the peptide chain to reverse direction as i said if you're going in one way then you form a loop or form a turn and you come down the other way then you have the main chain hydrogen bond that exists between the ith oxygen residue and the i plus 3th hydrogen of the nh residue proline and glycine are quite prevalent in this beta turns okay remember glycine has only this h as a side chain hence it's very flexible proline however does not have that h and it's very rigid so it actually ends up forming a bend or a kink and that's why this proline and glycine are so favorable out there so this is uh, an, an uh, you know an in depth look into these two turns so you can see this is a type 1 turn this is a type 2 turn both of these are beta turns so the type 1 turns and type 2 turns how do they do uh, differ they differ by a 180 degree flip between the peptide uh, unit linking residues 2 and 3 so if this is residue 1 this is 2 this is 3 you look at this uh, red um, uh, sphere out here and look at the type 2 what has happened is you can see this is again 1 2 3 but here it was pointing down here it is just pointing up okay often in type 1 here the residue is proline as i was sending uh, as i was telling you because it gives rise to this kink you know it is structurally rigid and then you have the glycine out here okay the glycine again is very flexible and it is often found in 3 so these turns are very important they are omnipresent because you, you got to have these you know, two different second structural elements if they got to be linked they have to be li linked by loops right or turns okay then there are different types of turns i'll just quickly go through it one is a beta turn we just looked at you know separated by our three residues there's a gamma turn right it's characterized by hydrogen bonds in which the donor excel are separated by two residues then we have the alpha turn we already know it's by four residues like an alpha helix and then there is a pi turn it's characterized by hydrogen bonds where it's separated by five residues remember the pi helix it was i i plus five it's almost something like that and anything beyond that is covered by this uh, terminology called omega loop it's a catch all term that's why it says so for omega loop i mean finally an omega loop is a catch all term for a longer loop with no internal hydrogen bonding okay so this is loop in the real sense it has no internal hydrogen bonding no ii plus three and so on okay now this is another thing you must have thought about okay if i take a beta sheet if i take an, um, uh, an alpha helix and if i do a statistical interpretation that means i, to, I take many proteins okay where i free down alpha helices free down beta sheets or a mixture of these would i find different amino acids occurring more frequently in the alpha helical region and would i find different amino acids occurring more frequently in the beta region that means would this amino acids be having preferences to come either as a part of an alpha helical region or as a part of a beta sheet or as a matter of fact turns loops or turns too okay so here these are some configuration preferences of amino acids and you look at this these are the um, amino acids on the first column then you have the alpha helix second column the beta strand and the reverse turn so the preference is given like this so the glutamate you can see 1.59 it is the highest preference then you have alanine 1.41 and as you go down this one is decreasing and so this black ones are the ones which are most favored for an alpha helix now what about the other two so if i go here here i'm talking about the beta strand now you can see this valine isoleucine tyrosine cysteine tryptophan phenylalanine and threonine these are more preferred in the beta strand with the valine being the most preferred okay and then when i go to a turn this reverse turn that means where i'm going to form this bend because i have to do a reverse turn then you can see which are the ones more preferred glycine 1.77 okay it's very high then you have proline 
1.32 as per region it is kind of close and so on. So, what we can say is this glycine and proline are often referred to as strong alpha helix breakers. So, now you will have seen something that means if I go to the previous slide really quick here you can see these amino acids they have strong preferences for alpha helices, but not that strong for beta strands and also not that strong for reverse turn. Now, if I go for these amino acids, these are these are more preferred for uh, beta strands, and if I go for these, these are more preferred for the reverse turn. Now, is, remember we talked about this, right? A couple of slides ago, that glycine and proline are better be found in this type in this uh, turns, whether type whether type one, type two, and that's what you exactly see. Glycine has the highest propensity. After that is asparagine proline, which are very similar. Especially proline comes very often. Okay. So, that also means that if these are alpha breakers as glycine and proline then they better not be found in alpha helices. Okay. Otherwise they would randomize the helix that means they would break the helix. So, then some general comments the basic sets of rules of for secondary structure prediction were devised by Chow and Fassman. So, some uh, I mean you should really look at this paper. So, what I mean is see once I know the preferences right that means what what secondary structural preferences the amino acids have. Now, suppose I am given a sequence of amino acids and I am asked can I predict can I predict the structure based on the sequence of amino acids I have that means would it be alpha helical or would there be a stretch which is beta or would there be alpha helix beta together which one would be loop and so on. Remember we have these uh, preferences right. So, then what we do is we say that alanine has a very high helical promiscuity we just saw it was 1.41. The hence it is very hard to find helices in isolation. Isolation means you cannot find one helix you can you cannot just take it out from uh, a, a protein and think that it will be stable as it was inside a protein. So, that is why if you are going to use models for helices you better have helices which have a preponderance of alanine residues or predominant by alanine residues. That is why it says almost all model helical peptides are alanine based because alanine has such a high helical propensity. Now, naturally occurring though alanine rich peptide is the type 1 antifreeze protein we will look at it in the next slide. So, minus is having long side chains like leucine, arginine, methanine, glutamate they are found in alpha helices why? Such that it is easier for these longer chains to move out of the crowded core region of the alpha helix. So, remember the helix is a cylinder, okay. So, I have to have these chains, longer chains, which can, if they are trying to point, they can easily just, just move out, right. They are free, they just move out of the helix core, and the core remains essentially hydrophobic, non perturbed, okay. So, this is uh, the antifreeze proteins I am talking about, and the one I am interested in is type 1 AFP. AFP refers to antifreeze protein. Okay. This is alanine rich right and you look at the sequence now this is a winter flounder sequence right it is fish. You can look at the sequence you can see how many amino acids it had this is about a 36 residue protein you can see all these blue ones are the alanine residues. So, it is a preponderance of alanine residues. Okay. Now, amino acids that are branched at the beta carbon like valine, isoleucine, phenyl are common in beta sheets. The proline is not common both in alpha helices and beta sheet as it lacks backbone NH to participate in hydrogen bonding remember we uh, told this before. Glycine is also of very less occurrence in alpha helices and beta sheets as it is devoid of a side chain here R essentially is equal to H and hence it is very flexible. So, you know if when thinking of flexibility try to recall the range of phi and psi values this glycine had it almost had it you know it was covering regions almost every quadrant of your um, phi and psi plot is not it. The proline and glycine are very common uh, for beta turns and can be considered as markers for such reverse turns. Okay. Now, think about this you are trying to predict right you are given a sequence you are trying to predict how do I predict. Now, what I do is I look for a stretch of amino acids or I look for the amino acids say I find a stretch which each and every amino acid has a very high propensity to form an alpha helix then I know maybe that one is an alpha helical stretch. Similarly, I look for say like proline and glycine occurring then if I look at a stretch where I see proline and glycine occurring then maybe that is a loop. Then if I have this valine, isoleucine, phenyl um, occurring in adjacent residues or in adjacent strands then possibly I would know that that is a beta region. Okay. So, now with this in mind that means you are trying to predict what the secondary structure of a given sequence would be. 
as I said secondary structure predictions I based on this. So, this is essentially a histogram representation of what we just saw a couple of slides before. You can see alpha helix clodomate is the maximum the alanine then you have beta sheet valine is the maximum then beta turn you can see here asparagine proline glycine these are very high. So, once you have this information or these sets of values then you use this for secondary structure prediction. So, what uh, we are looking at is you can see these 10, 70, uh, 140. So, this is a 4 to 490 amino acid protein and out of that I am just showing you 140 amino acids. What I am trying to do is out of this 140 amino acids I am trying to predict whether I would be having any helix or any turn or any beta something like that. Now, what are these DPM, DSC and all these things these are different programs which gives you secondary structure predictions. Okay. So, we will not go into that uh, much, but let us see you can see all these H's, T's, C's, E's occurring. So, what does H stand for? A stands for alpha helix, E stands for beta strands, C stands for loops and T for turns. All right. So, we now know what loops are, what turns are, we have already understood this. So, then you can see here typically if you go through you can see these blue ones are these alpha uh, these uh, helices, then uh, these E's are the strands right. Again the C's are the loops, the coils essentially are the loops and these T's are the turns. Now, if you uh, look across all the different programs of uh, you know all the different uh, you know the secondary structure prediction programs you can see well they differ among senses, but overall they do a decent job in terms of a comparison among these different programs. Okay. Now, as Chow and Fassman said what do we do? So, what do we do is we look at P alpha something referred to as alpha helix potential. So, potential of forming an alpha helix is referred to as P alpha good. Okay. So, that means we are predicting helices now what we do is we find a nucleation site that is say as I was saying you look at a stretch of amino acids say 4 out of 6 continuous residues adjacent residues like this with P alpha greater than 1. Okay. Good. So, P alpha means it has a potential of forming an uh, alpha helix which is greater than 1. Now, we extend that means is it going to extend forever or what happens on the other sides. Now, extend helix in both directions until a set of 4 contiguous residues adjacent residues are found which have an average of P alpha less than 1. If P alpha is less than 1 then it is definitely a helix breaker. So, that means we know that the, there is no longer a helix formation there right. So, initially we had this helix formation now we are looking for helix breaking by extension. If average P alpha over whole region is greater than 1 it is predicted to be helical. Okay. For beta strand again the same thing will happen find nucleation site 3 out of 5 contiguous residues with P beta greater than 1 extension extend strand in both directions until a set of 4 contiguous residues of 10 with P beta less than 1. When I am talking about P beta less than 1 I means I am talking about beta breaking that means it is not conducive for beta sheet formation. If average P beta over whole range greater than 1 it is predicted to be a strand. So, essentially Chow and Fassman said that these are some guidelines based on which you can predict your secondary structure. See it is you know it is uh, not so hard once you know which are the alpha uh, which are the minor acids which are prone to form alpha helices or be found in alpha helices and beta sheets then you can go you know go about doing these necessary justifications or logical conclusions. Okay. Now, that is what you know I wanted to talk about in terms of secondary structure remember secondary structure is very important alpha and beta we have talked about then we also looked at our turns then we have also looked about some amino acid preferences and whether or how we can try to predict based on the given numbers or based on the preferences what sort of secondary structure a sequence can take. Okay. But you have realized one thing it is not always easy so suppose you are trying to teach me and you are trying to tell me okay, so this is how the protein looks like and the protein has alpha helices and beta sheets and everything and then if you are trying to tell me how a protein looks like just by drawing uh, with your hand a pen or pencil then you really have to draw the alpha helix or draw the beta sheet now that is not always easy. So, do we have easier ways of trying to depict these things okay? the schemes. So, this is what the topology diagrams look like you look at this so I am mainly looking at the beta. So, this is n so these arrows so this is a beta you know this is a beta strand is given as a beta sheets all these are beta strands. Now, when I go for the topology see how it looks like. So, this this one is looking like this this is a strand there is just a loop 
I am showing again it is like this like this. So, that means, I have simplified this very I have simplified this very you know terrifying looking structures to very simple structures as alpha helices can be denoted as cylinders, beta strands as arrows I just showed you. I have not showed you alpha helices here, I will show it to you later. So, then this is what topology means, topology essentially means nothing, it just tells you okay, I have this complicated protein structure, if I got to tell you how protein structure looks like in, in easier terms, I would rather go by the topology rather, uh, rather than the individual, you know stereochemistry and all, that is what it leaves in topology, you do not know about the individual uh, facets or the individual uh, you know characteristics, but what you know is essentially the topology the overall scheme or the overall structure and it becomes really handy if you are trying to explain something to somebody. So, the other parts apart from alpha and beta strand, the other parts essentially ribbons that is what you see this ribbons and all out here. Okay. Now, what about super secondary structures? We have talked about secondary structures turns and all. So, what are super secondary structures? Now, remember when we are talking about secondary structures okay, secondary structure is either alpha helix or beta uh, sheet Okay, those were individual that means alpha helix one continuous beta sheet it needs to have two strands then you have the loop and all. So, here when we are talking about is we are talking about a combination of uh, secondary structure and you will see what I mean here. Some simple combinations of secondary structural elements have been found to frequently occur in protein structure and are referred to as super secondary structures or motifs. You must have heard this word protein motif if you have uh, you know gone through uh, you know papers related to proteins and all. So, motif is a very commonly used word and this is what it means simple combinations of secondary structural elements. Okay. Now, sometimes motifs are associated with particular functions although structurally similar motifs may have different functions in different proteins. Okay. So, motifs again we often talk about motifs and this is what a motif means. So, let us look at an example. So, here what I see out here is on the to your left this is an helix there is a loop there is a helix it is a helix turn helix I can say it is a DNA binding motif. So, this motif in DNA binding proteins you will often see this motif being present. Then this is a calcium binding loop again there is a helix this is a helix this is a turn the green one again this is a helix right there is a calcium binding motif often known as the EF hand. So, this is what a helix turn helix is that means I you have a helix. So, this is a helix right this a helix red one then it is green which is turn and then the blue one which is the helix same here there is a red one then the turn then the blue helix. Okay. The let us uh, consider in one the calcium binding motif that is the E f hand. So, this motif comprises of two helices E and f that flank a loop of 12 residues. Now, five of the loop residues are calcium ligands and their side chains should contain an oxygen atom and preferably be either aspartate or glutamate. And the residue 6 of the loop must be a glycine because the side chain of any other residue would disturb the structure of the motif. Now, remember glycine is very flexible. So, here glycine E is needed. Now, the E f hand if you look at the sequences this uh, per valmumin calmodulin or troponin C. So, these are calcium binding proteins they are characterized by this presence of this E f ha e hand motif okay, the E f hand I will show you what the E f hand means again. So, here you can see this is the E helix that is why it is E then loop then the F helix. Okay. So, that you know this motif is formed by the E and the F helix helices with the loop in between. So, this loop these are the corresponding amino acids which are which correspond you, know, so you can see this um, uh, the, the under this uh, stretch the amino acids are the loops you can see this um, aspartate right aspartate out here that is what we needed. You also have a glycine which we need to have then we have this glutamate out here right which was necessary this um, oxygen atoms. Okay. So, the calcium binding residues are orange and the residues that form the hydrophobic co of, uh, core of the motif are light green. So, these proteins are calcium binding and the residues which are shown in orange are the ones which actually bind to calcium or correlate to calcium. How? Let us look at the next slide. So, this is what I was talking about you can see this is helix C, this is helix F, this is the calcium where it is bound, this is the loop where calcium is bound. Okay. This is called the E f hand you can see this is the calcium right, this is helix E red, this is helix F blue and this is your loop region and the calcium is bound here. Now, how is the calcium bound? As I said this is the motif, now this is the loop of troponin C okay, uh, the calcium binding protein you can see this is calcium here. Okay. There is a D 13 
aspartate there is a D 9 and aspartate there is uh, then um, an N 11 and asparagine then have a water molecule W out here then you can see this is E 20 glutamate which is also uh, kind of here ok. So, he, this is helix E this one is helix E and this one is helix F. So, this is how the calcium is coordinated to ok. So, the calcium is coordinated to all these different surrounding atoms that is why the presence of those atoms was really necessary ok. And here you are looking at troponin these are the 4 E F modus you can look at the 4 E F modus. So, 1, 2, 3, 4 green regions these are the calcium uh, atoms out here you can see this is one helix this is other helix. So, these two these so, so this one this one or this one and this one for example, this one and this one they form the E F and this one and this one they form the E F and and so on. So, there are two more on the other side ok. So, this is then an helix turn helix motif or E F hand which is responsible for calcium binding. The other one remember was responsible for DNA binding that we looked at the first slide when we started talking about this modus. Then what is the other kind of motif? It is a beta hairpin motif remember the beta hairpin we talked about is the simplest motif involving beta strands in which two anti parallel beta strands are joined by a loop it is very common in occurrence ok. So, this is what you see uh, here also you can see this is one beta strand you can see the arrow out here this arrow is pointing this direction for this one it is pointing in this direction that means these are anti parallel here also this one is pointing in this direction this one is pointing in this direction this is anti parallel ok. And these you can see this hairpin loop this hairpin loop or this hairpin bend ok this is from the bovine trypsin inhibitor and this is from the snake venom erabutoxin ok. So, this is what I mean by a beta hairpin motive see nothing much you just need to know if you look at this you know ok this is what a beta hairpin motive is nothing big I have two anti parallel beta strands connected by a bent loop. Then the Greek key motif. So, this is how Greek key motif looks like. So, the Greek key motif is found in anti parallel sheets with four adjacent beta strands. The motif occurs in many beta sheets, such as in the enzyme Staphylococcus nucleus. This motif occurs frequently in protein structures, but is associated with no specific function. So, this is important. It is not that every motif has to be associated with a function, it is like the EF hand or the calcium binding, it was calcium binding, then the DNA binding. Okay. Here, this Greek motif it does not have a function, but you can see these are four adjacent beta strands that is what we are saying. So, all these are anti parallel and that is how we are having these loops coming through. Remember these are also topology diagrams ok. ok. Then the beta alpha beta motif. So, if two adjacent strands are consecutive in the amino acid sequence the two ends that must be joined to form parallel strands of a sheet are at opposite edges of the beta sheet I will just tell you. So, what I mean is if you have one thing like this and if one thing like this they are going like this. So, but they are not being connected here what what will happen is you have to come from here come all the way here from one edge to the other edge and then connect is not it. So, that is where you need this alpha and that is why the beta alpha uh, beta motive is so important and you will see very soon. The connection between the two ends are frequently made by alpha helices and the motive that is formed is thus a beta strand followed by a loop an alpha helix another loop and then the second beta strand this is what I was talking about ok. See this is N C going the same direction again this is N C going the same direction, but for this one to be connected to this one I cannot just connect here right that is not that is not the way the sequence goes like N to C then again N to C. So, what I do is I have to take this whole loop I have to come here from one edge and I have to come to the other edge and connect to the back which is here the N terminus and how do we connect what we do is we use a alpha helix that is most commonly used to connect between uh, two parallel beta sheets right and that is why it is called a beta alpha beta motif. Then you can see the topology diagram this is the first time uh, I am showing you how an alpha helix is depicted remember alpha helix is depicted as cylinder that is what you are seeing that is not a big deal because alpha helix looked like a cylindrical coil ok. So, this is one beta second beta two strands parallel and then they are connected by this alpha giving rise to this beta alpha beta motif. So, this motif is uh, found in almost every protein having parallel beta sheets ok. So, I guess um, we have talked enough about uh, the secondary structure super, 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 super uh, secondary structure I mean uh, after that and then uh, which are these motifs. 
So, what I will do is in the next classes, what I will do is I will talk uh, a little more about um, you know other things like domains and this helix helix uh, packings, different sorts of packings, how you know in the tertiary structure, how these helices or beta are they are packed against each other. So, we will try to look at this um, in a little more detail in uh, the next class, and after that, we start or uh, you know, or we uh, go on with the journey and look at the forces that are available in proteins, right? That would be very important. So, after having looked at structures, some structural experts, after we have uh, got you know some um, idea of what different structures are, possibly if you take up a protein, you would be able to recognize okay, this is the structural element we talked about, or this is the sort of motif we had we talked about, right? You would uh, possibly uh, you know it resembles something we had discussed in class. And then the next obviously big thing is what are the things, what are the different forces that hold these different secondary structural elements or the whole protein unit together. Okay.